All right, today we're going to be doing chapter three of OpenStax University Physics, Motion Along a Straight Line. So what we're going to be doing is starting to build up the mathematical language for describing how things move. We're going to start in one dimension because uh, we have to get that right before we expand to talking about three dimensions. Now, if you've already had a physics class, which is somewhat common in this introductory uh, sequence, then this may be a little bit of review, but I encourage you to actually go through it and make sure that you really understand everything forwards and backwards, because when we introduce motion in, a, in three dimensions, uh, then you're going to be build, need to build on this. Plus, any small holes in your understanding or skills that you're missing uh, are going to accumulate and it's going to be harder to move on to the later material. Plus, be aware that it's going to, uh, that it's going to get more complicated as you go on. So if you've had this before, the class is going to get harder at a later point. All right, we're going to start with examples of one-dimensional motion. So here you can have an instructor walking back and forth in front of the board while talking. So you can approximate this as motion in one direction. Um, the professor is moving in either left or right. You can also talk about bicycling along, uh, along a straight path. The bicycle can either go in this direction or in that direction. So the motion is somehow confined. Uh, and then we can start describing our velocity. Remember that velocity, so velocity is a vector. It has a direction and a magnitude. Um, so to describe something's velocity, we need a direction and a magnitude. When we talk about motion in one dimension, we are going to simplify the mathematical language and use the sign of the velocity uh, to tell us which, to tell us the direction. So uh, we're not going to use the vector notation quite yet. Um, if you want to practice it, it is a good idea to get in the habit of writing all vectors as a vector, uh, mathematically. OK. So here you can have a person leaves. So Jill leaves from her house, goes half a kilometer in one direction, goes half a kilometer back goes one kilometer in the, in the first direction and one kilometer back. Now, whenever we do a physics problem, we need to come up with a coordinate system. Um, so we have to describe Jill relative to her house. We need to make what is ultimately an arbitrary decision, which direction is positive, which direction is negative. By convention, we tend to make right positive and left negative. Um, and unless I have a good reason to, I'm probably going to stick with that convention. But it is ultimately arbitrary. Uh, and you can make any choice that makes sense to you. If you make a slightly different choice, it is going to change everything by a sign. So here, whenever I'm doing a physics problem, one of the first things that I do, I just like drawing a y-axis, even if I'm not going to need it. I like to draw an axis, so I'm defining my coordinate system here. So this is x, and actually I think I'm going to put the 0 for x in a slightly different place. So instead of putting the 0 um, at the corner, I'm going to put the 0 at her house. Now forgive my limited drawing skills, I am a physicist, not an artist. Um, so. Jill starts, and now we're going to draw Jill's position as a function of time. Um, so note that this is negative 0.75 kilometers. Um, and let's say half a kilometer. She's going to take 10 minutes to get there. And we will say that it takes 10 minutes for her to get back and 20 minutes, she's walking kind of slow, 20 minutes for her to go one kilometer that way and 40 minutes this way. So we need 80 minutes 
on our axis. We're going to put time here. And this is position x. And we need the scale to go up to one kilometer. And we need the point at half a kilometer here. Um, and we need 0.75 kilometers. So then we're going to do 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Okay, so in the first 10 minutes, Jill goes, we're going to assume constant walking speed. She goes from zero to half a kilometer. And then she goes from half a kilometer, x equals half a kilometer back to zero in the next 10 minutes. And then in the next 20 minutes, she goes a full kilometer and then in the next 40 minutes, she goes backwards. Three quarters of a kilometer. So this is what Jill's position as a function of time looks like. Um, so we call this her trajectory. Um, and if we were to draw a vector in this space, which shows us where she is relative to home, um, when she is out here, her position relative to home is this. When she is here, her position relative to home is here. So these arrows that you show. Um, and when she goes out there, maybe she's going to the store. And here she goes to work. So these arrows show her position vector as a function at, at various times. Um, now, the choice of where we put the zero for the position is totally arbitrary. So if we had put zero over here instead, um, we would just draw a different x-axis. So we would just have a different x-axis, so we would shift everything down. So this would be, she would only end up back at zero at the very end. We also could arbitrarily have put the zero here, and then you would have this for your x-axis. Now, this highlights one of the first things about physics problems. There's a lot of arbitrary choices. Uh, there is no one right answer, but a complete answer for a problem like this is going to define what your coordinate system is, and then you're drawing a picture relative to that coordinate system. Sometimes we tell you what coordinate system you should use. Often there is one coordinate system that is the most obvious, but that does not mean that it is the only right answer. Um, that also means that we have to be very careful when wording physics problems. So if I had, for instance, an automatically graded problem on Canvas for this type of problem, I'm going to ask you something like, how far is Jill from her house? Because any coordinate system that you use, you give the same answer. What is the distance? Um, or I'm going to have to tell you what coordinate system you need to use. Use, the, use Jill's house as the origin of the coordinate system. And I'm going to have to tell you if you can get away with treating, with doing uh, position in one dimension, so you do not have to have a full vector. Um, be on the safe side. If you are asked to give me a vector quantity, give me a vector quantity with the full, um, with the full coordinate system. So if here, if you were asked what Jill's position is, her position is x equals 0.5 kilometers x hat. So a full answer, oh, I'm a little off the board, forgive me there. Um, a full answer includes position, direction, and units. Units are really important. Um, my children 
give me lots of lovely examples, but they're not usually very convenient to report on this, where they will say, you know, how big is, how heavy is something? How big is someone? Well, he's like 90% big. That's what my, my four-year-old says. Units matter? Uh, my, my now eight-year-old used to talk about everything being 10 meters. So he ate 10 meters of hamburgers. Right. Um, so units matter. This one you would write as negative 0.5 kilometers x hat. Now remember last time we talked about notation. There's a bunch of different notations that you can use. Pick one. I don't care. I like the x hat, y hat, z hat notation, so I'm going to use that most often. This position is one kilometer x hat. Um, this position at the very end is negative 0.75 kilometers x hat because she is three quarters of a kilometer from the origin. All right, get in the habit of meticulously writing out. So start, when you start a physics problem, start by drawing a picture. Sketch your coordinate system. That is communicating to me, the person who's grading your work, uh, what, <laughs> how, what your coordinate system is so what your answer is. Um, and double check if you have time, especially on exams, but it, certainly on homework, um, to double check your answer, make sure that everything that is a vector is actually written as a vector and that you don't, everything that is a scalar is written as a scalar and check that you have units on everything. We will sometimes work with quantities that are unitless. If you have a unitless quantity, you do not have to have units. If you are unsure if you need units, when in doubt, ask the instructor. Any, quest, any ambiguities in what the problem means Ask the instructor. It's always better to ask before it's due than to figure out after the fact that you didn't do it right. All right, so this is a similar, this is basically the graph that we just sketched, um, but in nice pretty notation because it was drawn by a computer, of Jill's position as a function of time. So that is her displacement from the origin. This used that default origin at the, the house. All right. Then, when we're talking about the velocity, velocity, like the displacement, has a position and a direction. Or it has a magnitude and a direction. So, the velocity is the slope of the line at any given point. So, when we go back to this one, if you are writing the, if you're figuring out the slopes of this, um, so in this point, the slope was half a kilometer for um, every 10 minutes. So that is three kilometers per hour. That's pretty slow. Um, this, it, this is the velocity, and it's a positive three kilometers per hour x hat. This one is a negative three kilometers per per hour x hat, and then the third segment, which is this guy right here, um, is a positive, the slope is again a positive three kilometers per hour x hat, and then the slope right here. Now it's negative, and I said that she took 20 minutes, actually, so my, I think my x-axis is a little bit different from the, maybe not, I think my x-axis might be a little different from the one on the, um, on the sketch. Um, so if it is 20 minutes to walk uh, 1.75 kilometers, that is a negative 5.25 kilometers per hour x hat. Now, if the problem did not specify the units you have to give the answer in, you can give the answer in any units that have the right dimensions. So velocity has to be distance, uh, has to have units of distance divided by units of time. If I have not specified 
you could give that answer in kiloparsecs per, uh, per millennium. Don't, please. It makes it a lot harder to, gra to grade. But if I didn't specify, you can. Now, I, I've been waiting for a student who's going to be cheeky enough to do that on, uh, on some problem. I haven't had anyone do that yet. I probably will now. Um, I would probably deserve it, because I certainly gave my instructors their fair share of trouble. Um, but if I didn't specify what units you have to use, then you can give them to me in whatever you want. Now, often I'm, I'm lazy, and I say use SI units. SI means System Internationale. It is a, a system that was developed to unify all units, and we're going to work with, you're going to work on learning what those all are. Um, but if you, I say you have to use SI units, you cannot give me a time in light years or in parsecs per, uh, per millennium. You have to at least use SI units. Okay, so we're going to be doing this a lot. The um, If you have a plot of the position as a function of time, you can sketch what the velocity is. So you guys should be taking calculus or have taken calculus. In calculus, you're going to be developing these, um, these concepts as well. So you have the, um, the slope of the tangent line. The slope of the tangent line gives you the derivative. The derivative of Position as a function of time is velocity as a function of time. So here, um, where you have at the top of the curve, the slope is zero because the tangent, the slope of the tangent is zero because that's the only line tangent to the curve. So here you can say that your velocity is zero. Um, and then if you pick, um, so here you can approximate it um, if you take two points, what we're going to do is velocity is approximately some small distance delta x divided by delta time. So we're going to use successively smaller segments to approximate. Bear with me while I get used to the dimensions of the light board here. Okay, so if we use a very large segment, then we can calculate the change in position as a function of time. Um, and it's going to give us this green line. Now, when we, um, when we do calculus, we are taking the limit as delta t goes to 0. So we're going to move these chunks smaller and smaller and smaller. And in the end, we get the orange line, which is exactly tangent to the curve. Uh, so if you've had calculus, these concepts are old hat. If you have not had it already, you're going to be developing them throughout the, your calculus course, and we're going to need you to use them in physics too. So they might be, uh, you might be developing the concepts in both classes in parallel. Okay, so here you see a plot like this where you have the tangent to a curve, um, it, where you see a position versus time, and you can calculate a tangent to the curve. We're going to develop your skills so that you can sketch, given a position versus time, so you can sketch a velocity versus time. Um, so at any given point, as you know, because from, say, riding in a car, at any given point in time, you do have a specific velocity defined. Um, and you, so you know in that car if you are going left or right, um, but you have to... Uh, but we're going to work on building up the mathematical tools to actually describe it. Okay, so here you can see another example of a position versus time graph. Now, this one is easy because you just have a straight line. If you are asked to plot the velocity as a function of time on this one, you would just read it off of the graph. So in this first segment, this is... We'll say it's a 0.5. These are even harder to read on the light board. So um, if I get it off slightly from the book, please forgive me. So in this segment, the um, velocity, here I'm going to cheat and just use signs to indicate the direction and not write the full um, vector notation. So this is half a meter 
per half a second. So a positive one meter per second. Then I look at this segment and there is the delta x, because remember we're doing velocity is approximately delta x over delta t. In the case of a straight line, it is exactly delta x over delta t. Um, and here, there, delta x is zero, so the velocity is equal to zero meters per second. And then we travel, let's see, this is 1.0 seconds. So in one second, it goes negative 0.5 meters. So in this last segment, then we have velocity equals negative 0.5 meters per second. Okay, so you're just reading off the slope. Now, this is your first introduction to, some, to a way that physics is different from your intro calculus class. This looks nice and neat. It's very easy if you have a straight, uh, straight line for your position as a function of time. Often, we do not. In an arbitrary case, we do not have a straight line. In physics, you are often making approximations. So we will often take something messy, or messier than this, but somewhat messy, and approximate it as a, as a, you know, use our approximation. Velocity is approximately delta x over delta t. Might not always get us the right answer exactly, but it's going to get re us really close. And that does a few things. First of all, there's very few problems that you can solve exactly. So if we're working in a space where we do not have problems we can solve exactly, um, we still at least can give an answer and get pretty dang close, and often that's close enough. Um, and second of all, if we do have something we can solve exactly, or at least solve to higher precision using more advanced methods, the quick and dirty approximation often gives us a gut check. It tells us if we're moving in the right direction or if we're totally and completely wrong. All right, so here's another one. So this is actually taking that plot before and doing what we did um, by hand. So taking those positions as a function of time and calculating the velocity in each chunk. In the first segment, it's moving positive. In the second segment, it's going, it has a velocity of zero. And in the last segment, it has a negative velocity. All right, so here um, we want to distinguish. Um, this is the position is a function of time for some object, and this just happens to be a parabola. So the position as a function of time is of the form x equals um, ax squared plus bx plus c. And then the slope of that, the velocity, is equal to 2x 2ax plus um, plus b, um, and that gets, so that's going to include the sine. So here you can actually get a negative velocity, um, whereas, and, and that's going to depend on what these constants a, b, and c are. Now the speed, the speed does not it is the magnitude of the velocity. So to get the speed, you're going to take this plot and you're going to take the absolute value of it. So here at the point that the velocity um, hits zero, you're taking the absolute value. So your speed goes up instead. Read problems carefully because sometimes we ask for the velocity. Sometimes we ask for the magnitude of the velocity, which is the speed, and sometimes we ask for the speed. Uh, physics problems are uh, very detailed, and it matters how carefully you read the problem. So be careful and read everything in detail so that you don't make stupid mistakes. Um, stupid mistakes are 90% uh, of the mistakes that stu students make are 
stupid, which doesn't mean that they're actually hard to make and it doesn't mean that you're stupid. It's that physics involves a lot of gory details. The difference between beginning physicists like you and an expert like me is not the number of stupid mistakes that we make. Actually, I would argue I probably make even more stupid mistakes. But I have built up a system of thinking about how to solve these problems where I'm checking myself along the way so that it's not that I'm not going to make the stupid mistakes, but I'm going to catch them a lot more. Um, so we're going to work on not just teaching you the basics of how to solve problems, but the thought process for how to catch yourself in stupid mistakes and how to catch yourself if your answer is totally wrong. Because if you're studying physics, you're probably pretty good at math. Sometimes it can be very easy to dump a bunch of equations on the paper and start turning the crank, and you can go really, really far, and your answer is just totally wrong. Maybe because you made a sign error. Maybe because there was an inherent assumption in there somewhere that you didn't catch. So we're going to teach you how to make sure that your answer is actually right through the course of the semester. And still, you can often go wildly wrong, but you at least will get better at not going wildly wrong in trivial ways. All right, now we're gonna talk about acceleration. So, position is the derivative, uh, or sorry, velocity is the derivative of position. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So, uh, if we have, so we have x is position or displacement, v is velocity, a is acceler acceleration. Now, in one dimension, we will often call negative acceleration deceleration, um, but it's always acceleration. Okay, so velocity is approximately equal to some change in distance, change in position vector over time. And in, for linear motion, or sorry, for straight, for motion with a constant velocity, this is exactly true. Acceleration is approximately the change in velocity as a function of time. Okay, so you have something which is traveling in this direction and it is accelerating, its acceleration is negative. That means it's gonna start faster and then slow down and then it's gonna reverse. Now notice that I was trying to change my speed as I did this. So I start faster and slow down. So now I'm slow, but I'm speeding up, but going backward. And yes, I encourage you to get up and move along with this because the more you move, the more you're going to remember all of this stuff. Okay, so problem, the protocol for solving a physics problem. Start by drawing your coordinate system. That's the first thing you should do. The second thing you should do is start sketching what you know. So... Um, and I also often like to write what I don't know to make it clear what I don't know, so what I have to figure out. So here you can see that the initial velocity in this problem is zero. The final velocity is negative 15 meters per second. The coordinate system is defined like this. Now, if this is a constant acceleration problem, and almost all of the problems that we're gonna do in this class are constant acceleration, because you guys, don't have the mathematical chops yet to describe much more complicated problems. Also, there's a large body of problems where this is actually physically realistic. Okay, so now the uh, velocity, um, sorry, the change in velocity is the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Now, I want to note a few things. I tend to use I, uh, V sub I and V sub S for initial and final. Sometimes you will see V sub zero um, 
I find V sub i a little bit less vague, so I'm going to tend to use V sub i. Okay, so now our initial velocity is zero. Our final velocity is negative 15 meters per second x hat, and then this is a minus zero meters per second x hat. Note that I have units on everything and I have unit vectors. Okay, so that means my change in velocity is negative 15 meters per second x hat. Um, and now my, uh, let's see, this does not say how many seconds it took me to do this. So if I'm asked for the acceleration, I need to be given more information. So let's say it took one second, because one is an easy number to divide by. So if our delta t is one second, then our acceleration equals negative 15 meters per second x hat divided by one second, which is equal to negative 15 meters per second squared x hat. So, position has units of distance. The SI units of distance are meters. Velocity has units of distance per unit time. The SI units of velocity are meters per second. Acceleration has units of time divided by, or sorry, distance divided by time squared. The SI units of acceleration are meters per second squared. So, a complete answer is going to have all of those details. And as I said, we're going to mostly do, and certainly in this chapter, it's all constant acceleration, unless we're drawing sketches so you can qualitatively figure out what's going on in more complicated problems. All right. Now, here we have more complicated uh, problems. So here now we have the velocity as a function of time, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to approximate it. We're going to take the delta t. Let me write the equation over here. Velocity, so acceleration is approximately equal to the change in velocity per, uh, over the change in time. So we are going to take the, um, we can draw a straight line between two different points on the curve and calculate the change in velocity divided by the change in time. And we can slowly make that change in time smaller until we get it, we say, infinitesimally small, so as small as you can imagine. And it's going to be, in this case, at uh, exactly the maximum, it's a straight line. But we could have chosen any other point, and we would have gotten different point, different lines. So here, the tangent is something like this. Over here, the tangent to the curve is something like this. Forgive my drawing skills. We can do something the same. Now, this describes an object which is going fast and slowing down, and then the velocity, it slows down, and then it starts speeding up again. Um, so this is, you can take the velocity, so take, again, you're taking, um, you can take a large chunk of time and slowly narrow it down until you get to the, um, you get to the, uh, s s the smallest part you can imagine. Um, and you can also do the same thing at any other point. Now, if you have a curve like this, if it turns over like this, this is the maximum velocity. If you have a curve like this, the point where the, the acceleration is zero is the minimum velocity. Um, and you'll run into problems with both. It's important to remember that where your acceleration is zero, you could either have a maximum or a minimum of velocity. So again, read the problem carefully. Make sure you understand what the problem is asking. 
Um, these problems are confusing for everybody. So as you get into the problems in the chapter and I'll read all of the word problems, keep in mind that everybody has trouble with these. You have to read them very carefully and parse the information out of the problem. So one of the skills that you're going to develop is taking the information out of the problem and writing it in mathematical language. OK, so here you have velocity as a function of time and the corresponding acceleration as a function of time. So here, the velocity as a function of time has a constant and negative slope. If you look, it takes one and a half seconds. Um, so we can write the acceleration equals change in velocity over change in time. And it takes 1.5 seconds to go from a final, a, 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 sorry, an initial velocity of three meters per second to a final velocity of negative six meters per second. Um, and we're going to let the sign do the work of the vector. Um, so we'll just, because I cannot, I constitutionally cannot write a scalar equal to a vector. So I'm going to use my motion in one dimension cheat and just drop the vector signs. So this is now negative 9 meters per second divided by 3 halves of a second equals negative 6 meters per second squared. So that is my acceleration. When you go down and look here, we have a constant acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared. All right, and this is showing, you can hardly see it. So this is the vel velocity at versus time um, at different positions. And the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration is always going to be the magnitude of the slope of the tangent line. So these are a little faint on here. So here you can go here. This is what it looks like. Here you have a zero, here you have a negative number. So if we're looking at what this should do, take the first thing that I do when I'm trying to evaluate what's going on is look for the zeros. So here I have a zero in my acceleration because I have a maximum or a minimum. So I'm gonna drop down and make sure that this goes through a negative line, or sorry, through zero right there. Um, and then here, I start with a um, larger velocity, and I'm constantly decreasing the magnitude of the velocity. So here, ah, so here, ah, here I have a steeper slope, and then it's getting more and more shallow. So that means my acceleration is getting lower and lower. Um, and by I, you can see it's a parabola. The slope of a parabola is a straight line. So here I start steep, and I get more and more shallow, and then I turn over and become negative. So I start at my highest velocity, uh, my highest acceleration, and I decrease down to my lowest acceleration. When I ask students to sketch, the acceleration as a function of time, given the velocity as a function of time, or the velocity as a function of time, given the position as a function of time. Pay very, very close attention. If I say sketch, I don't mean that you need super high accuracy. I'm going to look for you to make sure that you have the zeros in the right spot, and that you have the sign in the right spot, and that you have roughly the relative magnitude of those quantities. So the acceleration is larger here, then here, you start with a very large acceleration and you flatten off to zero, and then here you start going negative. I'm going to look for the, the qualitative trend. Now, if I to ask you to make a graph, a graph means numerical precision. If you're watching this and you are not in my class, your instructor, instructor may draw slightly different distinctions. 
When in doubt, ask for clarification. Clarifications are going to help you. Always ask for clarification rather than get confusing, confused. All right, so now we're going to talk about some acceleration examples. Um, here you have acceleration as a function of time. Here you have something which is slowing, which is con has a positive acceleration for the entire duration, but the acceleration is getting larger and smaller. So you're not accelerating constantly. So that's like you're driving and you are speeding up on the interstate and you maybe aren't going speeding up at exactly the same, you know, your acceleration is not necessarily constant, but you just pulled onto the ramp, you are going to be um, speeding up the entire time, even if your acceleration is not exactly constant. Okay, here, this shows something where your acceleration is positive and then negative and then zero and then you jump to positive again and even faster and positive and then negative. So you don't know what your speed is. It depends on how fast you start, um, whether your speed is positive or negative. But here you're accelerating really fast and then you now you're slowing, you're slowing down. So see, even though I've been doing this for years, you know, that I instinctively want to go backwards when I see a negative acceleration. That's not what negative acceleration means. I am speeding up and now I'm slowing down. That's what the negative acceleration means. Now I'm going, I have a zero acceleration, which means that I have a constant speed. And now I, well, I've run out of space, so I'm gonna reset back here. And now I have a positive acceleration, so I'm speeding up, but not as quickly as I was before. And then I speed up even more. So this would be a really, you know, maybe you're in a weird traffic pattern. So you're merging on the interstate, and, you know, here a car jumps in front of you, so you can't accelerate as quickly. Um, and then here you have a lot of free space. Here you have a lot of free space. Oop! There's a police officer, so you're going to start decelerating. All right, so these are the plots. Um, it's how we visualize what's going on with acceleration. Um, here you can see uh, velocity versus time with constant acceleration, um, and then velocity versus time with a changing acceleration. So here, if you have a constant acceleration, it's going to be a straight line. That's going to be a lot of the problems that we're covering in this class. If you have here, you have a, so the slope is very steep, so you have a large acceleration, and then the acceleration slows down, but it's still positive. And then you settle off at a constant acceleration. So this is merging onto the exit ramp, um, sorry, merging onto the, um, to the freeway from the, the ramp, and then you're almost up to speed. And then you just sort of take your time to get up to speed. Um, maybe the speed limits, if the speed limit is 70 miles per hour, maybe you're getting up, uh, you're getting up to 60, and then you're going to take your time to get all the way to 70. But you have to be going fast enough that you're not obstructing the interstate. All right. So here is another example. You start, um, if you're landing an airplane, the airplane initially has a positive velocity and it is slowing down. Um, that means the acceleration is negative. Even though the airplane is always traveling in the same direction, the acceleration is negative because the airplane starts fast and slowing down so it doesn't crash into the terminal, you hope. Um, so acceleration is negative. Acceleration being negative means that you are slowing down. Not that you are necessarily um, going in the negative direction. All right, so a skill that you are going to need to develop is sketching velocity and acceleration. Oftentimes when we have people who are, when I have students who are particularly good at calculus, they blow this part off because they don't think that it is actually important. Let me urge you not to. First of all, if you're in my class, it's going to show up on the test. I always have one of these on the first test. It trips up everybody. Um, just because you understand mathematically how to do it doesn't mean that you're always going to be able to describe what it is doing graphically. 
develop this skill. Let me encourage you to develop this skill. So, sketching acceleration versus time. And I like to write problems where I make you go all directions. So you might have to go from position versus time to velocity versus time, and then velocity versus time to acceleration versus time. I might give you acceleration versus time and ask you to build up velocity versus time and then position versus time. Do it both directions. It is much easier to go from position to velocity and velocity to acceleration than to go the other way. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and we're going to do sketch, which for me means that you do not have to worry quantitatively about the, um, the values, which is good because there's no numbers on this plot. So here we are going to have velocity versus time. We are going to need some negative numbers. So we're going to try... So we're going to put our x-axis sort of in the middle, um, and this is time. All right, the first thing that I'm going to do is find the zeros. So here is a zero. It's all the maxes and mins. Here is a zero, and here is a zero, and it sort of looks like all the way out here is a zero. So here are my zeros. And then here, it looks like I only, I sort of reach the same positive. So this here, my slope is negative. See, I started to make a mistake. So the slope between A and C is negative. So I'm going to go, I'm going to have to go negative down here. And then here, my slope is positive, and then it goes negative, and then it goes positive, and it sort of, it slow, it looks like it goes back to zero. Okay, now my slope is largest in this segment, and it, so I want this to be the largest positive segment. That maybe is the same, roughly the same amount positive as this is negative. This is a little shallower, and this looks like it's also shallower. So these guys are going to be a little bit higher and a little bit lower than my other ones. So here I start I'm at the most negative at A, and then I'm going to go... B is a little lower, and then I go through C, and at some point, I have to turn around, and then these guys never go quite as far. So here, if you were doing a graph, you'd want some numerical estimates of what's going on. Because it's a sketch, you don't need a numerical estimate, you can just you can get close. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and do my acceleration. Let me choose a color which is much more different than this one, because that's not looking quite different enough. So, ooh, that's different. You'll notice that I do not have good handwriting. I'm okay with that. All right, so here, I have a zero, here I have a zero, here I have a zero. Now, this is positive, so my acceleration is positive and goes negative. Or, sorry, my acceleration is positive and goes to zero, and then my acceleration is negative and goes back to zero. And then my acceleration is positive, it goes back to zero, and now my acceleration is negative. So that's my acceleration. So the steps that I do are first find my zeros and draw those little points at zero because my line has to go through zero. Then I make sure I get the signs right. 
And then I go back and I say, okay, now that I've got the signs right and I know roughly how I want to draw my curve, let me look at the relative magnitudes. So I get the relative magnitudes kind of sort of right. And if it's a sketch, I don't have to get them exactly right. If it is a graph, you should do some quick calculations um, doing this. Uh, the approximations that we went through, uh, the velocity is approximately equal to the change in position as a function of time, and the acceleration is approximately the change in velocity as a function of time. Do those quick and dirty calculations to get you in the right ballpark. Okay. Now, here's a more complicated one. We're going to do this one. We need some, we actually need a lot of negative slope. We need to use a lot of dynamic range here. Okay, so this is going to be, now this is velocity, so this is going to be acceleration. We're going to go the other way on this one too. So this is acceleration as a function of time. Okay, so here I have a zero, so I'm going to go through that point, and then E is also a zero, so I'm going to go through that point, and then H is a zero, and now, let's see, for my acceleration, here I have a positive and large slope. So I'm going to maybe put it somewhere way up here. Here I have a negative and small slope between B and E. Between E and H, I have a positive and intermediate slope. And then between H and I, I have a pretty negative slope. And I would say Let's see, so here, this is going to do this. Actually, I would argue that it maybe even plummets a little faster because it looks kind of close between A and C, and then it suddenly plummets. So, mm, the noises help you think too. I encourage you to do whatever works for you. Now here we have a roughly, um, we very rapidly go to a roughly constant slope, and then we reach this point, and we very rapidly go to a roughly constant negative slope. So that is roughly my acceleration as a function of time. We're going to go ahead and use the same trick here. We're going to use different colors, and I'm going to actually have to draw the x-axis, draw the zero at a totally different spot down here. Um, for position. So now we're going to, this is, so going from velocity to acceleration is something called taking the derivative. Um, if you're far enough in calculus, that's going to make sense. If you're not, you will have that concept introduced. Going from velocity to position is called integrating. Okay, so now one thing that we can see by looking at velocity as a function of time, the velocity is always positive, or maybe it's zero at the very beginning. So here we are, so here the slope of the position is large and positive. So we are moving pretty, f now I have to be, let me actually still keep these. So here we have to, we're moving pretty fast. And then we're going to move slightly slower, but our velocity is still positive. Um, and then we're going to go a little bit faster. So we're going we're gonna to have another kink. Let me actually exaggerate this a little bit. So here we suddenly start accelerating. We start speeding up slower, uh, but I have to, that's the velocity. Yeah, my, I'm moving away slightly slower than I was before. I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit so I have enough room. Then here, 
I'm going to have another kink in my curve. And then here, I'm going to slowly plateau. So that's not the best drawing ever. I find it harder to draw, um, to draw images that integrate. So you still have to, you can still take the basic idea. Now, if you want to double check your work, if you've integrated, you can go the other way and see if you get the curve you started with. If you take a derivative, you can integrate and see if you get the curve that you started with. I encourage you to practice this a lot because it trips students up a lot more than they think that it will. Um, and I do expect you to do a lot of this. The reason I think that it's important is because it's developing your problem solving skills. So when you see this set of plots, it's going to help you double check your answer because it's very easy to write equations down and start chugging along and end up doing something totally and completely wrong. And it will hurt. Um, because you can spend a lot of time doing the wrong thing. Especially, many of you guys are physics majors. When you get into upper division classes, you might have problems that take you five, six hours. You want to be able to check your work along the way and make sure that you're not going totally off the rails because it will be a lot of time wasted. Okay, so the number one application of motion with constant acceleration is free fall. That is things dropping. We're going to talk about this a lot. Anything that is in free fall, anything that drops. And the next time, um, so at some point you're going to meet my pet warthog, Wanda, a stuffed warthog, and I like to throw her when, when teaching physics. So we're going to be doing free fall. Um, and Newton's key observation is that two objects fall at roughly the same, um, have roughly the same acceleration, um, even if they are heavy. Now, that is making an assumption that there is no air resistance. We can do a short experiment here. Um, the marker is a lot heavier than the, the cloth. They're gonna hit, they're gonna fall at about the same rate. You saw, just like you did in the figure, Actually, the marker falls a little bit faster because there's a little bit of air resistance on this one. But it's pretty dang close. One of my favorite questions to ask is very, very easy. If you drop a feather in an elephant, assuming no air resistance, which one hits the ground first? It's not that this is a hard question, but you better get it right. If you're going to pass introductory physics, you better understand that in the absence of air resistance, they both hit the ground at the same time. All right, so here you have, um, you have some object and it is, uh, you dropped a ball off of a building. Um, you start with, um, an, you are starting with an initial velocity and then it is accelerating downwards. And what we're gonna do is develop the mathematical tools to describe what's going on here. So, we are going to use a few different equations. Um, we are going to use the position. We're, I'm gonna drop the vector notation because we're all in motion in one dimension. So we have the position the final position is equal to the initial position plus the initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time squared. The final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. And then you have the you have v final squared equals v initial squared plus two delta x and then delta uh, forgive me I always get this I always get tripped up on this one which is why I write it down now physicists tend to not memorize and then just derive I do that too so 
v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2 times the acceleration delta x. This is all for constant acceleration. So this is going to be your toolkit, and then you're going to work from there. So in this problem, if you wanted to describe what happens when the object falls, you want to describe the position as a function of time. For free fall, your acceleration is always negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Technically, it's negative 9.8. Eight, one on the surface of Earth, roughly. There is a slight variation in that gravitational constant as a function of the position. We will get later in the semester. We'll talk about the gravitational, you know, gravitation in a more general sense when you're not near the surface of Earth, and you will see that that acceleration equals negative 9.8 is itself an approximation. But it's a really dang good approximation when you are close to the surface of Earth. When you are close to the surface of another object, such as the moon or another planet, that gravitational constant will change. Later in the semester, you will learn how to calculate that. For now, we are going to treat it as a physical constant that describes the universe. This is one of our first examples of a way when, that we are approximating the world in physics, and that approximation is pretty good for most cases for what we need. So now, if we want to describe uh, the position as a function of time, if we are asked to, for instance, when does this hit the the um, when does it hit the ground? Um, you would start with your position as a function of time. You know your acceleration. You are given the initial velocity, um, and you have to draw an arbitrary coordinate system. So, from the the problems from the numbers here, this is setting. Uh, the, this is setting, actually, key point, this is setting the x-axis along here, so that it is falling, uh, is falling in the x-direction, and the zero is up here at the top of the building, so that when the object hits the ground, it is at the, it is at negative um, 98 meters, because the bottom, the top of the building is at x equals zero meters, and the bottom is at negative 98. You could have drawn a different coordinate system and put your zero here, and in that case, this number would be zero, and this number would be 98 meters. Um, either way, your velocity is still going to be negative um, because you're defining... Uh, uh, actually, I drew this as if negative, you're always going, you're always decreasing, yeah, so your x is still positive in this direction, it's just that your zero is up here and not here. So this is one of the first examples of why it is important that you draw your coordinate system as one of the first parts of the problem, because if you draw, you know, most of us would inherently draw the coordinate system with zero here. That's fine. This didn't. To understand the numbers that you see, you have to have the coordinate system drawn. When you're writing me an answer to understand your answer, I have to know what your coordinate system is because the coordinate system is arbitrary. In fact, I like to assign problems that beat into you that the coordinate system is arbitrary. All right. And... Forgive me, some of these images look a little bit funky um, on the light board, but at least I get to draw on the light board, which really helps, I think, solve problems. So here you have a baseball hit straight up, caught by the catcher five seconds later. We can ask the question, how high did that ball go? So what we know is that the, um, well, we can do a few different things. Uh, I know that at the top of that trajectory, the final velocity is zero. So if I'm asking for what the top of the trajectory is, the V final is equal to zero. I don't know the initial velocity, um, and I know the time. The time is five seconds. Um, I know the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so if I want to, so I want to look for a 
so problem where I, I want to look, if I want to ask how high did it go, I want to look for the ones where I actually have something I can work with. So I have, I don't want, I have to start with time. I don't want this equation. So I can use this equation, and this is going to, I know the final velocity and the acceleration and the time, so I can get the initial velocity. And then I can put that in here and use that to get the final distance. I like to solve things algebraically, and I would very strongly recommend that you do the same, because if I solve them algebraically, then I can plug the numbers in later. Looking at the equations helps me see, for instance, if my units are correct. Um, so we're going to do some unit checking. So first of all, I'm going to solve this equation for the initial velocity. The initial velocity is the final velocity minus the acceleration times time. All right, so I'm going to put that in here. V final squared equals V final minus A t quantity squared plus 2a delta x equals v final squared plus a squared t squared minus 2a t v final plus 2a delta x. And this is all equal to v final squared. I have a v final squared on both sides here, so I can cancel it out. And I get 0 equals two a, negative 2a t v final plus a squared t squared plus 2a delta x. I am trying to find this. I'm going to move these guys over here, and I get 2ATVF e, uh, plus, I'm sorry, minus A squared T squared equals 2A delta X. All right, now I'm going to divide through by 2a. I love drawing in different colors. Okay, so these guys cancel out. And I have delta x. Ooh, I suddenly switched main color. Let's not do that. I'm going to shift up here so I have a little more space. Delta x equals v final t minus a t. Oh, now that I see this, I actually could have done that in a totally different way. Duh. Um, so this is going to, this is how I would get the distance traveled. To the, the, the maximum height. I also can start with this equation and get it much easier. x final minus x initial equals delta x equals v. That should have. Oh. Here I wrote this as. Yes, I have a final velocity of zero, and here I can do, this is, ah, that's why I couldn't do this one, because this one has the initial velocity times time plus one half, ah, I dropped the two there, um, and this is still a t squared. Um, so this is a negative, this should be a, ah, that's acceleration. 
here, this is a positive g over 2. This would be a negative. So I have the initial t minus g over 2t squared. I can plug in my v initial here. Um, it is, so the v final is 0. So this part goes to 0, and I get delta x equals g over 2t squared. Here, I can plug in, so v final equals this, and this should be a, so my v initial is, My v here this is ah uh, g is neg so my acceleration is negative g so this tells me because v final is zero this is positive g t so this is positive g t squared minus g over 2 t squared, which is equal to g over 2 t squared. So I get the same answer. The, this equation is somewhat redundant with this guy, but it's convenient in many cases because it already has time removed. And no matter what I do, I get the same answer. Um, and you will notice that even I have to be somewhat meticulous and get tripped up. I drop my t here. I could tell I needed another t because it had the wrong units. We look at units here. This has units of distance. Oh, sorry, this has units of distance. This has units of distance per time, unit time squared times time squared. So if I look at units, g has units of meters per second squared, and I'm multiplying by second squared. That has units of meters. That has the right units. That's why you keep everything symbolic till the very end, because it makes it a lot easier to see whether your units are right. Often when people are just beginning, what they do is that they try to plug in numbers as soon as humanly possible, and then when you make dumb mistakes, which you will do, you cannot catch yourself because you've already plugged the numbers in and you've probably started dropping units. It will be a little bit painful at first to write everything in terms of units. It's going to pay off. So I would urge you to simply get used to doing it. And I would urge you to do it now, while the problems are fairly simple, rather than wait to develop this when, it is, uh, when you're going to need to use it much more. All right. A rocket releases its booster at a given height and velocity. How fast does the booster go? So we are after, um, so we are given a height. Um, we'll, that will be an initial x. So x initial equals some height. Um, v initial equals here, I'm going to use the v sub 0 to make sure to differentiate between what that is, it is going to be in the positive direction because you're, gonna re you're not going to shoot a rocket towards the ground, at least not on purpose. Um, and the rocket's going to reach some maximum height and then turn back down. So if we sketch what it's, um, we're going to sketch x as a function of time. It is released at a certain height, it goes so we want to find out how high um, it is going to go and what it's, um, so how fast. So we need to know the, so how fast does it go if we are assuming 
that it is going to um, that it is undergoing free fall. Later we will consider drag, but not well, later you will consider drag if you continue on to upper division mechanics, and we're not going to work with drag right now. So we need to know, so how hot fast does it go? It's always going to be slowing down. Um, unless we, well, it will excel, it, will, it might be slightly faster when it hits the ground. We can ask how fast is it when it hits the ground. That's a more useful question. Um, and those are really two problems. Let's first answer, how high does it go? So we want to know x final. Um, and we are given v initial. We, of course, have the acceleration equals negative g, um, which it equals all the time in this unit, but I like explicitly writing it because later you will, because there are cases where you deal with one-dimensional motion where the acceleration is constant but not g. Okay. This looks like a good problem for this first equation because we know everything, well, we know everything here except time. We need to figure out the time, so we can use that with the quadratic equation. And I'm just going to set it up and not actually solve it for you because this, this is going to be, this is all algebraic anyhow. Um, so x final equals... Ah, so to get the time, we have to do, we're going to have to do V, ah, actually, no, sorry, we can do, we want the last equation. The last equation is easier because we know the final velocity at the top is zero. Zero equals the initial velocity squared minus 2G times the height. So the height is equal to v initial squared over 2g. So that is the maximum height. And then if we want to figure out how fast it goes, uh, that's a trickier problem because we have to figure out how long it takes for it to reach the very bottom. Um, so you can plug back in, it's really a second stage. So you plug back in the, um, now we need to know, we don't know the final velocity. We do know the final, so we're going to consider the second stage of the problem. I'm going to change colors to make it clear. The second, second stage of the problem, the initial height is our delta x equals 2, equals v initial squared over g. v initial squared is so over 2g. Over 2g is our initial height, and our initial velocity is going to be zero because we are in free fall, so that's from this segment over. And then we go to, um, then our acceleration is always negative g. So we have, uh, and our x final is going to be the height of the building plus the initial. And then um, we can write h plus v initial squared over 2g is equal to v initial squared over 2g minus g over, that's a bad g, minus g over 2t squared. And we get some cancellations here. And, uh, ah, I forgot, let's see, negative, my x final, ah, my x final is zero, because I'm looking at when it hits the ground, and my x initial is this plus h. That's my mistake. So, this is 
H plus V initial squared over TG, and this is equal to zero. So now I can solve this for time equals the square root of negative, or sorry, no, I get the negative signs cancel out, h plus v initial squared over 2g divided by g over 2, um, and that gives me the time, and then I can plug it back in here to the acceleration to get how fast the booster will go. And we're going to do more examples that are very similar in the next chapter. Uh, the basic idea, start by sketching the problem, draw a coordinate system. It is a good idea to have this set of equations readily available because this is your toolkit. And then you're going to start by writing down everything that you know um, and then identify what it is that you're trying to solve for because that's going to be, um, that's going to guide your algebraic path. And then you solve the problem, leave it all algebraic until the very end, and then you can check all of your answers uh, before you turn it in. All right, that's a good place to stop. So we're going to see you guys next time for chapter four. Thanks.